Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Roger Distruti. And as you know, every month we strive to bring a different department, roles and responsibilities uh, to your attention and give an overview so you can learn a little bit more about the breadth and the important work that happens in Sheboygan County. And today we're very fortunate to have our Finance Director with us, Mr. Terry Hansen. Terry, welcome. Thank you, Adam. Pleasure to be here. Terry's been with us now for, believe it or not, five years. This is the fifth budget that he's gotten uh, a key leadership role on, his fingerprints all over. So we're going to talk a little bit today about our overview of our budget process, as well as uh, the good work that's happening in the finance and IT department, a consolidated department. But Terry, please set the stage by sharing a little bit about yourself. When did you start with the county? and let our viewers know who we are. Well, uh, as you mentioned, I started in 2010, so this is the fifth budget cycle that I've been with the county. And prior to that, I was with the city of Sheboygan and had government experience prior to that on the state level, a quasi-state government um, organization as well, and also another municipality in Minnesota. So quite the breadth of experience in governmental accounting and I'm happy to utilize those skills here in Sheboygan. And that's right. We did kind of steal you from the city of Sheboygan there five years ago, didn't we? Yes, you did. How do you, any regrets? Have you been hoping to go back to the city of Sheboygan or are you okay with Sheboygan County? This has been a phenomenal move for my career. I think it's just been a great time. Everybody in, in the county is great to work with. While I, I do miss some of the people at the city, I do enjoy my time with the county. And you've really built a good team. I've been impressed with how you've uh, very effectively put some good people around you. And of course, as I mentioned, it's not just the finance department, it's the finance and IT department. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, well, in 2011, we consolidated the two departments and we had a lot of staff transition during that time. And the goal was to make the department more efficient, more effective, and deliver better services to the, to the county departments. And with a, partnering with a local company, Datamax IT Services in Sheboygan, we were able to deliver better services to all the departments. We have cut our costs by over $260,000 a year. And we have been able to invest more funds into newer technologies and um, better utilizing those for the departments. And we have built the staff up, or we're still below the staffing levels that we were before, but we have been looking at adding competent staff to deliver the services that we need tomorrow as well as today. So big picture, if someone hears of the finance and IT department in Sheboygan County, what are the roles and responsibilities of this department? Well, with the finance division, we handle everything financial related. So we do everything from preparing the financial statements, helping and assisting with the budget, taking the lead on that under your leadership, and then also ensuring that all the departments are recording things properly, properly recording grants, paying all the bills, um, and assisting with the budget and also business planning for the various departments. On the IT side, what we do is we handle all of the information systems that the county utilizes. So everything from the computer-aided dispatch that the sheriffs use to get people to where they need to be, all the way to how we record our accounting entries to uh, the system that we use for that to the taxation software that we use as well too. So it's quite the breadth of software and right now we're in the midst of implementing a new software system for health and human services. So we cover all of the IT needs, anything that needs a computer, we help support and help move them along. Very good. And we're going to come back to that a little bit more, but I'd like to start with the budget process and, and how the annual budget is put together. Um, share with our viewers, you know, when we start the budget process and try to give a high-end snapshot of how that process unfolds. Well, we start early in the year. Sometimes we start as early as February and we develop budget assumptions and how we want to, what we're looking at, what challenges we will be facing in the upcoming year. And then we develop those assumptions prepare some estimates as to what our budget gap would be of what we're tasked with, and then we bring that before the different committees. We bring it before the executive committee, the finance committee, and we also involve the HR committee as well. 
and we set up those budget, we go over those budget assumptions and then develop budget goals and targets. And then once we develop those goals and targets, we share those with all of the department heads and we've been keeping them in the loop as well, the whole process. But we really kick things off at the leadership forum in early June where all of the county board supervisors hear the assumptions, they look at the goals, they see where we've been, they see where we're going, and then we have our budget kickoff with all the department heads at the end of June. And from that point, then we really get into the meat of the budget process where all the departments are working with their respective staff, developing their budgets, so meeting with me and you to discuss what they're looking at, going back for revisions if necessary, but then ultimately giving it to their liaison committee they sign off on it, then they come and present to the finance committee, and then from the finance committee, it goes on to the full county board. Piece of cake. It's simple, so from February to October, <laughs> actually November until it's done. So. It's a lengthy process, it's an arduous process, but it's one where we've had tremendous collaboration and teamwork. I've been here almost 16 years, and, and Terry, you've done an excellent job as finance director or finance and IT director in your leadership role, but we've really had a tremendous collaboration here and it starts with Chairman Roger Destruti and the executive committee and the finance committee and of course just fantastic teamwork amongst our department heads and our liaison committees. Maybe that's a bit of a lead into my next question, but uh, what have you seen in your experience you worked for a local unit of government in Minnesota, you worked for the city of Sheboygan, now working for Sheboygan County the last five years. How does our budget process differ or what do you see as, as some of the strengths to the process in comparison to other budgets you've helped put together? I, I think the biggest strength is the communication with everybody, making sure that everybody's fully aware of what we're looking at, what we need to accomplish, and then the teamwork I mean, building off of that communication. Every department's working together and trying to accomplish all those goals. And there are no surprises. All the departments know early on in the game what, what we're facing. And I think that that's the biggest is the, the, longer, the longer process, but it's very well communicated and a big collaboration between administration, the supervisors, and the departments. And I think it, it's by far the best budget process I've been involved with. And obviously you've been a part of continuing to improve upon it. So the last five years, uh, you've had a chance to get your fingerprints on it and further improve the process. Any examples that uh, you can share where you've helped, again, further develop it and improve the budget process we have in play? Well, I think some of the items that we, we have improved upon is we have really developed an accounting lead role in the budget process. And we have been developing accountants within the finance department that can go out and assist and kind of help the department heads with their overall budget planning, where they wanna go and what they would need to do and try to help position them there. So we've really enhanced that over the last few years. And I think one of the other biggest changes this year was more of a paperless budget process. Mm -hmm. Before we'd go through endless reams of paper and different copies and versions, and I think now distributing it, distributing it electronically, we have eased that burden of which version are we looking at and, um, and people always have that information ready and available. So those are two of the biggest changes that we've done most recently. Two great examples and one, ones that you've really stepped up and provided outstanding leadership. If, if the uh, camera over my shoulder here can zoom out a little bit or onto Terry's lap, you see, you see he's got an iPad there on his, on his knee and Terry really I mean, you led the charge with the county board going paperless. I know when Chairman Mike Vandersteen was at the helm, he had some interest in seeing this happen and certainly supported that. But uh, as you know, and, and many of my coworkers know, I'm not an IT expert. That's not necessarily my cup of tea or passion, but it is for you. And uh, between you and Chairman Roger Destruti and the Finance Committee and now the whole board, 
is using these iPads and we have literally gone from binders of information or a tremendous amount of handouts at committee meetings to everyone looking at that iPad and being able to file through as well as more easily access information from prior meetings or minutes or what have you. So uh, that's been a, a tremendous asset to the county and, and I really appreciate your leadership on that front, Terry. Well done. Thank you. Last question before I turn it over to the chairman. Uh, sometimes citizens ask, well, how does this budget process work? You have a, a county board chairman, the chief elected official. You have a county administrator, the chief administrative official. You have department heads. You have liaison committees. You have the county board. You know, a tremendous amount of communication and collaboration needs to occur to put a budget to process together. But what's the respective roles of these key leadership positions? Well, um, the overall budget responsibility lies with the county administrator. And so you take the lead as far as establishing the parameters and the process and work hand in hand with the county exec or the county executive, county board chairman to establish the goals and targets and then bring those forward with the various executive committee, the primary leadership committee for the county board and the finance committee that deals with the financial matters. And now including the HR committee, which, um, is more for the benefits and the pay increases that we're looking at providing and incorporating their input on that process. And the various liaison committees look at the operational aspects for all the departments that they oversee and have their input operationally from a policy direction of, is this going in the right direction or not? And give their approval as far as how that budget process goes from the department head. But from the department head, they're looking at it from a professional administrator aspect of what do we need for our department to run function, to function properly and to run efficiently. And then with the resources that we have, what do we need, how do we need to allocate those resources? So from the tactical aspects and strategic department heads to the policy aspects from the supervisors, and then overall from a countywide perspective, you and the county board chairman and the executive committee getting in on there on those yeah. different levels. Nice overview. I, I think what Roger and I take pride in, well, I know we all do, Terry, is that so often here, when the budget is ultimately adopted, it's very anticlimactic. Uh, as Chairman Testrudi and I interact with our peers across the state, and I'm sure it's the same for you, Terry, as finance and IT director, you know, you hear about the hand wrangling and the late nights and the long meetings and people getting up on their soap boxes and, and really it becoming very confrontational. Uh, we just haven't seen that here in Sheboygan County uh, for over a decade now. And I, I truly think you hit it on the head earlier. It's good communication. We have so many good, thoughtful people, but we really take a collaborative approach. As you said, it's, it's my budget to ultimately recommend to the county board. <coughs> But if I did that alone, uh, as some administrators or county execs do, the county board could say the heck with that and then start preparing really their own separate county uh, uh, budget, annual budget. And then they try to meld the two together and it can really get time consuming and confrontational. So I think it's a real credit to, to Chairman Testrudi's leadership and all of our staff and everyone involved. We, we've got a pretty good uh, well-oiled machine here and. Hopefully that'll continue for some time to come. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Roger. Thank you, Adam. Great to have you with us, Terry. And, um, and thank you for your help in making that process go smoother every year. And uh, I think a lot has to do with the uh, electronic part of it and being able to get those numbers to us right away and we can make decisions accordingly. And uh, I know years ago we used to have, we could expect increases of the property value of 5% plus. And, uh, the last few years that has dropped and now it's sort of flattened out and uh, that's really affects us quite a bit in our, our uh, levying of the taxes. Would you explain the equalized value and how it impacts the tax rate and everyone in the county? Yeah, equalized value is the overall value of the county and each home gets assigned or property gets assigned a portion of that equalized value. And then that equalized value is used to determine the tax rate. And the tax rate is simply um, the tax levy that the county needs, the number, the amount of dollars that the county needs to operate. 
and divided by the equalized value. So that's how we come up with the tax rate. And the tax rate, however, it can get, become very convoluted because that equalized value can shift between, and between different municipalities. So some municipalities might see an increase in equalized values, other municipalities might see a decrease. So just because the county overall might stabilize or be at a 0.4% increase like we were for this last year, we, that doesn't necessarily mean everybody's going to see that. It's a, a combination of every property throughout the county. But um, Before you leave that, I want to make sure our viewers understand it. So what drives the equalized value number? What, how does that number get developed? Well, that number gets developed, and it's established by the Wisconsin Department of Revenue, and they establish the equalized value, and they have different formulas that they build this off of. And the overall goal of an equalized value is to, just exactly in the name, equalize out the property values throughout a community. So if one community has a large assessment that goes up and another community has a large assessment that goes down, they want to equalize this value out so there isn't a shift in county tax burden from one municipality to another because their, assessor, their assessors are doing different things. So this is a statewide approach to try to equalize it so your taxes stay relatively flat and that burden does not increase or decrease significantly from year to year. And uh, would you explain the, the state tax impo imposed uh, levy limits and uh, we have our own self-imposed limits on how much we can spend. Would you explain that to our viewers? Yes, in the past, the, the state had levy limits that were often had an inflationary factor where they would say 3% or 5% plus net new construction. Well, in recent years, they've changed it so now it's 0% or net new construction, whichever is greater. And the county's net new construction has been less than 1% ever since they've adopted this. So our self-imposed levy limits really took effect before when we had more latitude as far as we could increase 5% or 6%. The county often took a more conservative approach and would only do maybe 1% or even reduce the rates, which there was a time between 2007 to 2012, they decreased the rate four out of five years. However, with the levy limits, we can only increase the levy attributed to net new construction. And net new construction is what new buildings or what new value is being improved overall in the county. And that is what you can increase your levy on, is associated with that new construction. And what is the current uh, county tax levy and how much has it changed uh in the last five years or since 2007 might be a better break point. Okay, um, the proposed levy for 2015 is $47 million, slightly above that. Um, in 2014, the current year, it's at $46,444,000. However, back in 2007, the levy was $45,412,000. So, uh, from that point forward, as I mentioned, we lowered the levy four out of the five years there. And right now, the proposed levy in 2015 is only 3.5% higher than it was in 2007. So seven years have passed, or eight years will have passed, and the tax levy has only increased 3.5%. There's many different commodities that you buy right now that would, are not even close to a 3.5% increase in that time. And um, we're talking locally, but how do we stack up against the other counties uh, throughout the state? And uh, for instance, uh, how, how much have others increased during that time compared to us? Well, we did an, a rough analysis uh, and have kind of been moving it forward. And if we look at 2014, the time difference between 2007 and 2014, if the county would have increased its tax levy by the average that all counties increased. So some might have increased at 10%, some might have increased at one. But on average, if we would have taken that average and increased our rate by, or our levy by that, we would have ended up taxing our residents an extra $44 million 
from 2007 to 2014. So it's a significant amount of savings that the taxpayers have realized by the by the good work that the county board has done by keeping the tax levy in in check, if you want to use that term. Uh, and what are some of the major challenges that uh, that we have to face to keep those uh, taxes down and lower them? The some of the biggest challenges are the inflationary costs. Just because net new construction might be 0.4 percent or 0.6 percent, doesn't mean inflation stays at that rate. And we see inflationary costs of around one. 1.6 to 2 percent um, in the last few years. So we have those inflationary costs, we have contracts that we have that have higher increases for employees, and then just overall trying to make sure that our employees' wages are staying somewhat level, competitive. You know, a 1 percent increase is still greater than the net new construction, but by far is not a large increase for somebody. And then we have our um, health insurance that we have to worry about as well, too. The health insurance costs are increasing, and we're trying doing different things to try to keep those in check. But the largest factors are the inflationary costs and our health insurance. And then there's also those outside factors that and other outside factors that we have no control over is depending upon what the state does. Actually, in this year we've had some good news from the state having some increases in state aid this last year that were unexpected. However, in prior years we've seen our state aids and state revenues dropping. And um, so we have those aspects that we have to deal with as well too. And that's uh, just some of the ways the state budget impacts us. Are there others that they put restrictions on us or mandates or anything else? Yeah, that, uh... there are different restrictions on what we can end up collecting revenues for. Or if we do collect fines and forfeitures from, say, the clerk of courts, there's a certain amount that has to go to the state. So we have to go out and collect these revenues and then give a majority of it to the state. So we're not able to collect all those. And then in addition, we have unfunded mandates as well. So they'll impose some regulations that we have to administer and make sure that we're following up on, but there's no funding to go with that to support those programs that they're putting upon the county. Thank you, Terry. It's always great working with you, and I'll turn it back to Adam. Thank you, Mr. Roger. Chairman. Yeah, great, great example of an unfunded mandate is every county has to have a clerk of courts, and our clerk of courts, as Terry and Roger know, they collect fines and forfeitures and help administer our court system, our five cir circuit courts, whether it's getting our jurors organized or taking minutes at the at court sessions, what have you. They administer the courts, and of course you want every county to have fair and consistent judicial services. And what's interesting is the state mandates that we provide this service, yet county taxpayers are now supporting the clerk of court's office to the tune of over $700,000 of property tax levy a year. And one might say, well, why is that? If the state's requiring the county to do something, how come they're not providing sufficient revenue to get the job done? And the answer is, is because in many areas, the state over time has gradually provided less and less to support or fund certain programs and services. What really annoys me personally about the clerk of court's office, and we've talked about this internally and certainly to our legislators and others for years, is as Terry said, the clerk of court's office collects revenue, fines and forfeiture. They collect millions of dollars, but we have to forward that all onto the state and then we don't get sufficient money back uh, to fund the program. So the property taxpayer subsidizes that office. Uh, unlike the Register of Deeds, the Register of Deeds collects enough revenue from uh, its state mandate to administer its programs. Child support is another department, but uh, Health and Human Services, Clerk of Courts, Law Enforcement, there are a number of areas in Sheboygan County where we're required to provide a program or service but not given sufficient resources to get the job done. So we carry that burden over to the property taxpayer. And uh, as we all know, folks love receiving that property tax bill, particularly around Christmas time. And of course, I, I say that tongue in cheek, um, property taxes are probably the most despised tax there is out there. So many challenges in front of Sheboygan County to hold the line. But we also uh, have many good 
examples of streamlining or gaining efficiencies and it goes without saying that we're always trying to improve in Sheboygan County and and Terry I'll turn it back to you with the excellent example of the finance and IT consolidation not only did that consolidation occur a couple few years ago uh, we've had nearly a dozen consolidations in the last 10 years. Why don't you share a few examples of some departments that we've consolidated and garnered savings and efficiencies? Sure, we've, over the years, the county treasurer and the real property lister have been consolidated. We've consolidated planning and conservation together. And then, as you mentioned, the finance and IT. And then in addition, we have consolidated transportation, uh, created a department of transportation which consolidated highway and the airport and put them together as well too. Um, so I, I'm probably missing some because I know that the list is very extensive when we go through that, but those were some of the bigger ones and probably more recent ones that we've done. And it garners administrative savings and then specific to finance and IT that you led the charge on, I think your annual savings uh, if, if memory serves, close to $250,000 a year. Correct. We, and that's money that goes back that we ended up reducing. And then not only that, we have additional savings from operations that we're able to reinvest into newer technology. So we're investing more, but spending less. So it's, a, it's a definitely a win-win situation with that consolidation. Every budget process, we establish priorities. The county board, Chairman Distruti and others have led the charge on program evaluation and prioritization processes. We've done that twice. We review that as part of the budget process. And of course, there's always new initiatives and challenges forthcoming from the community. And one thing that we'd like to see more of is community involvement. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes remaining, Terry, but please briefly share, how can the public get more involved in, with the budget process and what are the next steps ahead? Well, all of the meetings with the liaison committees and finance committees are all posted on our website and they tell you which departments are going to be looked at and how they're going and there's actually information about the budgets with those agenda packets. And then finally, we have our submittal of the budget is going before the county board on the 21st. And then on the 28th, there's a public hearing to hear um, the public's comments on the budget process. And then finally, we adopt that on November 4th. So this is really coming up to the end of the time when the public can have their input on the 2015 budget. And anytime if they have questions, they can always contact the finance department and I'd be happy to talk the budget with them. Outstanding overview. Thank you, Terry. We covered a lot of ground, but great overview. And if you have more questions for Terry, don't hesitate to contact Mr. Hansen or his staff directly in the finance and IT department. We've got a wonderful website that their department was uh, very helpful in pulling together, so take a look at that, and, and we appreciate certainly your suggestions for improvement, so don't hesitate to reach out to us or any of the County Board Supervisors. Next month, we're going to have Charlene Cobb here, our Veteran Services Officer. In November, we celebrate Veterans Day, and every day should be Veterans Day, but we'll celebrate that in November, and Charlene Cobb's going to be here to talk about the very important roles and responsibilities of the Veteran Service Office. Until then, thanks for joining us. Thank you.